Welcome to the Food Junkies Podcast. Here, we aim to provide you with the experience, strength, and hope of professionals actively working on the front lines in the field of food addiction. The purpose of our show is to educate you, the listener, and increase overall awareness about food addiction as a disease with abstinence as the solution. Here, we talk about all things recovery. Most importantly, how to thrive rather than just survive. So stay positive, make a change for yourself, tell others about your change, and hopefully the message will spread. Welcome to the Food Junkies podcast. My name is Dr. Vera Tarman, and I am your host today, speaking with child nutritionist Jan Katzen. Jan Katzen is a certified nutritionist, researcher, and former Association Montessori International pre-primary educator with years of teaching and observing children. She has participated in research for preconception nutrition, that is, nutrition for the yet unborn and not yet conceived. Unbelievable. It's going to be a very interesting talk. Jan has authored several scientific articles, including the 207 article, Declaration of Nutrition, Health, and Intelligence for the Child-to-Be. Of note, she published Nutrition for Development and Learning Guide and Workbook, a book that focuses on nutrients uniquely and collaboratively within brain development. Her books specifically cover psychoactive and addictive foods that short-circuit brain function. Jan is passionate about early nutritional intervention, and her book includes tools and exercises and detailed nutritional discovery forms. The Center for Guided Montessori Studies includes her book and nutrition module for their teacher training courses. Currently, Jan is a clinician at Melmed Center in Scottsdale, Arizona, a medical center for assessment and treatment of developmental, behavioral, and emotional challenges in children, teens, and adults. Jan offers individualized meal plans and helps for all family members with disordered eating and sugar addiction. In working with meal plans, she typically has to navigate many clinical issues such as autism, ADHD, as well as other mental and metabolic health concerns. She has a private out-of-state consultative practice that covers children, adolescents, and adults. Of interest to food junkies, Jan has also just published an ebook called Sugar-Free Brainy Breakfasts for Kids, and is working on a children's picture book called Hannah Was Eating Junk, which we eagerly await. Welcome, Jan. Oh, thank you, Vera. It's just so wonderful to be here and to meet you. And I have to pinch myself. You know, I've just really enjoyed my experiences with meeting the members of the Sugar Free for Life support group and just feel like it's family, like I'm here at the table with my family. Right on. Okay, thank you. Well, let's get to know a little bit about you. As much as you're willing to share, please tell us how you got into the field of nutrition and specifically how it relates to children. And then in that story, what was your aha moment about the discovery of sugar and food addiction in your professional life and, of course, in your personal life, as much as you're willing to share? Right, right. You know, I was definitely caught up in the quicksand of sugar addiction uh, most of my early childhood, teen, and early adulthood. And when I look back in the early part of my life, I really didn't go out searching for sugar addiction, but somehow it found me. And when I think about it, there were a couple of overarching themes as early as the playpen, as my mother has shared with me. The first is just a overwhelming emotional hunger and hunger for attachment and also a physical like a physiological hunger at the cellular level because I wasn't eating right I mean I wasn't eating the nutrients and it just really affected my mental and physical well-being and just a little bit about my parents my mom was a stay-at-home mom my dad an aeronautical engineer really smart guy Mensa classical piano cleaned the engine of his Ferrari with a toothbrush kind of guy. And uh, he really didn't want to have children. And my mother relayed the story to me that when he used to come home from work, I was in my playpen and she would say, oh, daddy's home, daddy's home. And I'd get excited, of course. And he would walk through the door and just walk right past me, not acknowledge me. I was invisible. So that really set the stage for my, our relationship. We did connect uh, later on in life before he passed on. So that, that was very healing. And this affected my mother's availability. 
her emotional availability. So this hole in my heart just got bigger and bigger. And then in elementary school, I discovered sugar and I would go to recess with the pennies in my pocket. And there were these long salty rod things and these big round sugary things. And I found the sugary things and they just really became my friends or so I thought, but then the addiction grew and grew the cravings. And then I would go the next day and get another sugary thing. And I've shared this with you, Vera, the cravings were like dancing on the blade of a sword. And I would always fall off and hurt myself and get deeper into the addiction. In fact, so much so that I knew which friends had the leftovers at their home and the families that bake. And I would go after school and go to their homes. And what was happening, I was started to get chubby. I mean, it's a chubby little thing. And I started having a body shame. And I remember going to gym class and having to wear these uniforms and I just hated my body. And I was just really depressed and started isolating. And so my mother took me to the pediatrician and went to the pediatrician and he, no food plan, no questions about what I was eating. He just took out the prescription pad and he wrote a script for diet pills. Mm, You were one of those, eh? Yeah, I was one of those. Kids that got the diet pills. Yep, 12 years old. I think I was 11 or 12. And it basically, what happened was, I'm sure that it restricted my eating, but never the sugar addiction. Never the sugar addiction. So I went into my teen years, my early adulthood, and the sugar addiction progressed into bulimic behaviors. I joined two gyms, I you know, bathroom bulimia, and I would just go out on night runs. I would go to restaurants and I would pick up desserts and then I would take them home and binge and purge. And I was just really, I was in really a bad spot. My electrolytes were all off. I was depressed, anxious. I was a mess. You know, I was bringing food home and waking up at night and then binging again. Anyway, I don't know how this happened, but (laughs) I look back at it now. A friend of mine just invited me to an AA meeting. So I went to the AA meeting and I was listening to the speaker. And then, of course, I had my eye on the goody table. (laughs) But I heard enough and spoke, was, was in a group and spoke to a few individuals. And I just opened up. And then I ended up at an OA meeting. And that was life changing for me. That was absolutely, that was the first layer. of my recovery. And I got a food plan, right? Finally got a food plan and just a wonderful sponsor. And in that OA context, you learned about sugar specifically, because not all OA is about that. It's about the eating behavior, but it sounds like you got the message that sugar was the problem. Absolutely. Because that was the problem, you know, that was, and that's what I was binging on. That's what I was And my OA sponsor knew the tricks of the trade, like what I should do, like if I was in the middle of a binge and what things to do. I mean, she was a blessing, 10 years. Mm -hmm. Betty was her name. Betty, I love you. (laughs) And I went to a lot of OA meetings. I needed them. I went to like two meetings, sometimes three meetings a week. I needed that in the beginning. I needed that support and love and nurturing and connection, really connection. So slowly but surely, the binging subsided. And all of a sudden, like I had this surge of energy, creative energy. And as I look back on it now, it seems that that was a metamorphosis where the pain and the struggle was turning into purpose. And it's like I was searching for, okay, so what do I do now that I'm not planning, you know, where I'm going to get the next fix and the next binge? And then all this creative energy and then... A friend of mine loaned me a couple of books by Maria Montessori. This is amazing. Secret of Childhood and the Montessori Method. And Maria Montessori, I don't know if you're familiar with her, but she was an Italian doctor, the first woman doctor to graduate from the University of Rome. And she created a whole methodology curriculum for child development. So there's Montessori schools all over the world. So I read the books and I was just blown away. I had been going to ASU. I was going to be a speech pathologist. But after reading her books, oh, and by the way, there was a chapter in her book, Refection, the Child's Diet, basically. And that was written over a hundred years ago. Can you believe it? I'm sure people know about the Montessori platform, but it's, you know, it's intended to be 
an alternative to the traditional dogma teaching, but by getting the child to explore as their own interests develop, right? Exactly. Yeah. Through all of the senses. It's very tactile. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. So and very child focused. Exactly. Yeah. And I had a Casa de Bambini. I had my own little children's house hmm. and I had my ten, ten, 10 little toddlers, but I'm jumping ahead. Yeah. But yeah, that's exactly what it is. It's hands on concrete learning, education of movement. So there's a lot of movement because children need movement. So I read these books, Refection the Child's Diet. I'm saying, what is going on here? And I was reading it. And Maria Montessori was really a pioneer in child development and brain development and nutrition. When I read her book, she's talking about protein, you know, making the meatballs, leave the fat and don't skim the fat. Well, of course, all the meat, I'm sure then was 100% grass fed and add olive oil to it. And she said, in her words, unreservedly, do not give the child margarine but real butter. So she knew how important cholesterol was for brain development. I mean, it builds myelin. It also builds the cell membrane stability, you know, so the mitochondria and the nucleus don't fall out. You know? I mean, everything has important focus, especially fats with uh, children brain development. So after reading that, my inner child is just putting the pieces together. So I change really purposes, focuses, and I took the Montessori training and I became a Montessori educator. And I worked with the really little ones, the two and three-year-olds. But you got and into nutrition there somewhere as well, right? Yes, yes. So I started, the Montessori mantras followed the child and I did. And I saw that there were two groups of children, two specific type patterns in the children in my classroom. Okay, some children were focused, go with the flow, happy, joyful, and other children were just coming unglued. I mean, they could not focus. They were behavioral problems. They were disruptive. They were aggressive. They were throwing things. And they were also, I even, there was one little girl that was even self-injurious. And I said, well, what is the difference here? What is going on? And I just kind of figured, follow the child. And I figured it's got to be the food, what they're eating. Mm -hmm. So I started observing them, looked in their lunch boxes, called parents morning, afternoon, you know, what did Johnny have for breakfast? What didn't they have? And it's like you would imagine, Vera, the children that were functioning well in the classroom, you know, they were eating like 99% nutrient replete foods, whole foods. And the other children were eating ultra, ultra processed foods. And I started taking copious notes you know, what they were eating, what they weren't eating. And then I got so interested in all of this and I could see, you know, the sugar in the lunch boxes. I could see that some of them dropped off at school eating sugary things. And, but I got so interested that I started investigating nutrients uniquely and collaboratively in brain development and child development. And, you know, I was going to fix these kids, right? I was going to find out the little learner's diet. So I kept researching and then I figured I'm going to research sugar first because I knew my battle with it and I could see how many children were eating. There was so much sugar on board. And I did the research at the time. And at that time, you know, the research was conflicting about sugar and adverse behavior in children. There was no mechanism that was identified until I came upon the research of William Tamberlane, a pediatric endocrinologist. He's professor of uh, pediatric endocrinology at, at Yale University. And he identified the mechanism. And in his cutting edge research, enhanced adrenomedullary response and increased susceptibility to neuroglycopenia. That is the mechanism. The mechanism meaning that the child eats too much sugar, even a small dose, like a teaspoon, about 4.2 grams, and they get an increase in body and brain glucose. And then just as quickly as it increases, you get a sharp drop. And to compensate, the body releases the fight or flight hormone, mm -hmm. norepinephrine. So boy, you know, I felt like I found the holy grail. So I hand outs to the parents. Let me just back up for the people who don't really know what you were talking about scientifically. Yeah. So just to put it in layman's terms, a child would eat even just a teaspoon of sugar. Their sugar would go up and then crash. Yeah. And the adrenal response would pump out adrenaline. And that is what caused that behavior that you saw in the classroom. Well, yeah, looking at impulsivity, inability yes. to focus, 
you know, it's like you get ahead of this and you just can't, you know, anxiety, just excessive movement. Some children, because of the fight or flight hormone, norepinephrine, they would also, some children pulled in, you know, some children like hid under the table. Yeah, I had, there was one little girl who would take off her clothes, go into the bathroom. She's only two and a half years old, go into the bathroom, take off her clothes and start biting her arms and legs. And this little one, I also had observed she would be dropped off at school with a muffin bigger than she was. So, of course, you know, her mother was beside herself between the pediatrician and child psychologist or or whatever. But then I'm reading about it and I put together a handout for the parents. And slowly but surely, the diets were cleaned up, actually. And I changed. There was no sugar. My classroom became sugar free. No sugar at lunch, nothing in their lunch boxes. We served nothing, no birthday cake, nothing like that in my classroom. So and I was able to do that in a Montessori classroom. So I kept researching protein, fats. So this is really a really life-changing part of my story, researching protein, you know, how important it was for growth and development and for making neurotransmitters, complex carbohydrates, you know, for the staying power and also the nutrients, the B vitamins for the sustained fuel throughout the day, rather than the roller coaster with the sugar, like a lot of these children were eating. And then I came upon fats and I'm reading about fats cholesterol, monounsaturated fatty acids like olive oil and avocado oil. And then I came across omega-3s. I'm saying, omega-3, you know, what is this? This this sounds like a, a Star Trek episode. So the more I read, most of the research at that time was omega-3 fatty acids and lowering the risk in heart disease. So, okay. But then I came across the work of this one professor, Michael Angus Crawford, and I have a smile on my face just with the memory. And his focus with omega-3 fatty acids was omega fatty acids in brain growth, development, and function. And I read most of his research. I had a med- Vera, I had a medical dictionary beside me words I couldn't pronounce. He's the godfather of DHA. I mean, he's almost a hundred now. Uh, DHA, decosahexaenoic acid. I couldn't always pronounce that, but I taught myself and I just, (laughs) but anyway, I'm reading about it. And then I wrote a paper and I sent it out to my families at school. And so they were reading about it and they started asking me, well, you know, what's a dosage? What do I give? How much do I give my kids? Do you think it would help them? And I didn't know. I I couldn't find anyone close by that could really give me that information. So I said, I'm going to write to Professor Crawford. He was the director of the brain chemistry, human nutrition at the London Metropolitan University. And I was, I'm going to write to him. He's a guy to approach. I never really thought he would wrote me back, write me back. So I wrote to him, emailed him one evening. The next morning was a response from him. And that became like a five-year relationship. He became my mentor. He took me under wow. his wing. And it was just really, I was really blessed. And we had this like symbiotic relationship. I would discuss things, the kids with him. I think his interest in me was that I brought realism to his work in the lab with the white knockout mice and the capuchin monkeys. I brought realism because I did discuss some children with him, particularly that little girl. And then he brought realism and science to scaffold what I had my anecdotal observations for all these years. So he was just a fantastic teacher. You know, I would describe some children to him and he would direct me to different studies. Some were his colleagues. And when I was talking about that little girl, the self-injurious little girl, he directed me to one of his studies. And that study was capuchin monkeys and omega-3 deficiencies. And they exhibited severe behavioral pathologies. Can you just give a two self, sentences? What is that? Self, self-mutilation, uh. you know? So, and this little girl was biting herself. I mean, you can't make this stuff up, you know? I mean, that I'm reading this, but anyway. Well, we tell us about the study. Just, I don't know what capuchin monkeys are. I don't know if they still use them, but they're experimental. Yeah. So we had a study with them and they were deprived, you know, in natural wild, they would have access to omega-3s, you know, in the grass and the plant-based omega-3s. And when they were deprived of omega-3s, they exhibited the severe behavioral pathology of self-mutilation. And here I have a two and a half year old taking off her clothes and going in the bathroom and biting herself, you know, and I know a big part of it was sugar, but omega-3 
when I sent out the handout to the parents about it, what I was learning, not that I didn't send that, that out. That was something that I read and, and I put the two together. And the girl's mom, Emmy was her name. Her mom came to me and she asked me, do you think this would help? Do you think we should start omega-3s? So at that time, it was like a teaspoon of cod liver oil. I said, well, it couldn't hurt. I mean, the behavior had subsided going into the bathroom, but it was still happening like once a week, something like that. But once she started taking the omega-3s, it completely stopped within a matter of seven or 10 days. So that's like a teaspoon of cod liver oil or some tuna or some salmon on a regular basis. You can get your omega-3s up there and potentially remove some of that aggressive behavior. That's amazing. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So this was our relationship basically. And then, you know, I knew it was time for me to change careers when I was more interested in what the kids were eating, you know, and oh, when we were making food in the classroom, it was amazing. We even had Ezekiel bread, you know, they were dipping it in olive oil. We had a steel cut oatmeal with walnuts. The kids were chopping the walnuts and we had beans and fed the children before we went into the classroom. Vera, I'm telling you, you could hear a pin drop because they had the fat, the complex carbohydrates, and the protein, Mm -hmm. the trifecta that was missing in many of their diets. Okay, good. I assume then that you got your certification in nutrition? Yes. Yes. Michael certified me as a nutritionist, but also as a nutritional researcher. He was my research director for my paper, Declaration of Nutrition Intelligence for the Child to Be. Okay. And I take it that from there, that's where you publish your article about the, I just find this amazing, this child to be concept. Can you elaborate a little bit on that? Like you're not even talking about children, you're talking about preconception. Exactly. Yeah. Preconception nutrition could save a lot of (laughs) heartache and nutritional trauma for kids, their development. It's also the preconception nutrition is not just for moms, but for dads as well, right? There are 23 chromosomes of the baby making, so that's 50%, 46 chromosomes. And you think about the fertilized egg, you think about the zygote, and you think about the embryo, and you think about that when before you even know that, that you're pregnant, a lot of times the neural tube is developing. So the brain is the first organ to develop during organogenesis. In that first month, literally, before you even know you're pregnant. Yeah. Three weeks. Three weeks, it grows and and closes. Yeah. And the power of nutrition and why it's so important for dads to also have folate, moms too. We know the importance of folate, preconception folate, women of childbearing age, all the pediatricians, the World Health Organization, March of Dimes, make sure you're, you're taking folate. Well, the same thing with the dads, because when that little neural tube is forming, Folate is needed for genetic expression. So each little neuron knows where to go. Okay, it goes here, it goes here. But if there's deficiencies of folate or B12 or zinc for that matter, it retards DNA growth. And this is beyond just spina bifida or something like that. You're talking about more than that. Right. It could be neural tube defects, spina bifida, cerebral palsy, even hair lip. There's another word for that. Cleft palate. Okay. But there's even an embryonic origin for autism at the time of the closing of the neural tube. That's just three weeks. That little neural tube closes and it closes at the base of the primitive brain. It's called the cranial motor nuclei, which is the connectivity to the left and the right side of the brain. Now, where does sugar come in all of this? High glycemic diets of mom, first of all, can impact fertility and also neural tube development, higher risk of neural tube defects, high glycemic diets, and also a higher risk of autism. So any time or stage or age, sugar can always play, be a creditor in our health and in our hopes and dreams. Can we also throw in allergies there that heightened? We have such a spike of allergies now in our children of, of today. Could that be a feature too, this neural, this early stage preconception? Or is that more like immediately after birth? Well, I think what happens, like if there's a poor material building the neural tube, the next organ to develop is the digestive system, the gut. 
and the thyroid. Which is very interesting. Yes. Yeah. So if that's poorly formed, you're not going to have the immune. You're not going to have that immune barrier. Okay. So the allergens exactly. are going to go right into the bloodstream. Aside from the autism, ADHD as well. Absolutely. Yeah. And it affects cognitive development, learning for the children. So here's, you know, the genesis of, I call it nutritional trauma for the child. So that's for parents prior to conception. Hey, Food Junkies listeners. We're just going to take a quick break here to share with you something our team thinks could help benefit your recovery with food, body, or self. Thank you again for listening. Hey, Food Junkie listeners, have you read the book Food Junkies Recovery from Food Addiction yet? It all starts there. This is the book with the basic theory and clinical knowledge of food addiction. Read this book first to get the basics. Our Food Junkies podcast jumps off from the book and is the ongoing breathing version, ever growing and ever expanding. Our podcast introduces you to all the issues of food addiction and the who's who of food addiction today. And if we at the Food Junkies podcast have inspired you to action, either to quit sugar or some other triggering foods or behavior, and you need some extra support, then please join the free Facebook group, I'm Sweet Enough Sugar Free for Life. There you will find a community of people who come from all parts of the spectrum, from the new and just starting out, to the long timers who call themselves food addicts in recovery, to counselors ready to give back and help you. The Facebook group even offers free support Zoom groups. Basically, it's a great online living resource of food addiction to help you stay sugar-free for life. So please join us. Now back to the show. If you have enjoyed this episode, please let us know. We love to hear from you. Kindly leave us a review on whatever platform you listen to our podcast on. We love getting feedback from our listeners. It would be fair to say that a standard American diet of today that mother and father are eating are essentially causing nutritional trauma to their fetus. Absolutely. Yes. When you think about it, when they're born, you know, if there's any kind of problem with latching, breastfeeding, you know, you hear a lot of these problems and then they're taking a milk formula. And the milk formulas, you know, I know this is going to be part of our conversation too, but this is a good time to talk about it. Yeah. The milk formulas, and I do a lot of probing when I'm doing my nutritional evaluation and nutritional history to see if the child, you know, was drinking a formula. And then I ask any ear infections, constipation, bloody stool, GERD, colic and you know a lot of times they'll go yeah yeah you know he was had ear infections at three months old was an antibiotic use so yeah that could really affect the child's development of the microbiome already being on antibiotics at three months old but anyway the milk the the issues with the milk is that vera it's it's not our great great grandparents herds of cows that bred amongst themselves All milk protein, casein, used to be A2. Those are the old-fashioned cows. But the inbreeding is causing it to turn to a mutated A1. And that A1 is pro-inflammatory. So, you know, ear infections, issues. It also can have a psychoactive effect in that it has a BCM7 protein peptide, which is a powerful opioid. Yeah, that's so that's when we talk about casein as being a morphine derivative, that's essentially what we're talking about is this version of casein that you're talking about, this newer version from cows of today. Exactly. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. So that's causing, you know, a lot of trauma for these little babies, you know, these little infants. I wonder if that might explain why some adults struggle with dairy, either through dairy intolerance, but also, you know, how some people are just addicted to dairy and others aren't, maybe because of this exposure, preconception, or in um, breast milk, or not breast milk, but formula. Yeah, yeah, that they were exposed to it. But even if they're drinking milk, regular milk, like these kids or even adults, I mean, they're still getting that casein, you know, that A1 casein. And there's a book, it's called The Devils in the Milk. Yes. 
Have you, are you familiar with it? I've looked it up. Yes. Yes. Yeah. I mean, yeah. It's so, the Kindle version, unfortunately. It's yeah. Yeah. Book. So basically, you know, it can harm us at any time. It's associated with juvenile diabetes, type one, heart disease, even mental illness, schizophrenia, you know, that A1 mutated. Mm-hmm. I mean, look at Howard Hughes. Do you remember him? Yeah. He was drinking milk all the time. Right. He was isolating with milk. That's all he drank. It was just give me my milk. So it definitely has a drug. It has a drug-like effect. So you were talking about the formula. So that's the thing that were would be one reason why you would caution against using formula? Well, there are different kinds of formula, which is really interesting. There are some formulas now that have A2 milk. So is that the good or the bad? That's the good. The okay. A2 is good. Yeah. yeah. The A1 is the mutated okay. milk. So there are many formulas now. A lot of them are European formulas. So not only do they manufacture it with the A2 milk, but they also manufacture it with more lactose. They're not putting any added sugar in it. And oligosaccharides, which are a carbohydrate, they add that to the milk, which is a healthy one. Actually, it's a prebiotic. So that's what you want to look for, like in an infant's formula. And the oligosaccharides are like found in the sugar, like in onions, the carbohydrate in onions. Huh. Or the carbohydrate in what we love, which is the Brussels sprouts. I don't know, but I taste a lot of sweetness in the, yeah. Yeah. In the Brussels sprouts. And that's that's what, uh, so yeah. So I was doing a little of extended research for this. And I'm saying, I got to share that with Vera. <laughs> a Brussels sprout lover. <laughs> yeah. yeah, absolutely. Okay. So is there anything else about preconception uh, nutrition that you want to talk about before we go into childhood nutrition and adolescent nutrition? I think basically I'd like to talk about the secondhand sugar in breast milk. It's for oh, the, wow. Yeah, the women yes. that are exclusively breastfeeding, and if they have high glycemic diets or they're eating ultra-processed foods, they have fructose in their breast milk. And it's not a normal component of breast milk. Lactose is. So, you know, I, I th- hope I'm pronouncing his name correctly. Michael Goran, who wrote uh, Sugar Proof Kids. Yeah. Yeah. So he has a grant from the National Institute of Health to really research childhood obesity. And he is looking at the genesis of childhood obesity and looking at breastfeeding. Wow. And so he did a study with 25 mothers exclusively breastfeeding. The children were not eating any solids. And he took the measurement of the children at one month and six months. And then they analyzed the mother's breast milk at the beginning of the study. And they found levels of fructose in their breast milk. Some had more than others. So it's the moms with the highest levels of fructose, their babies at six months old exhibited adiposity. Uh They already had increased body fat at six months old, just from fructose. Even the size of a grain of rice, that's how, you know, it just is not metabolized properly and it really is a a creditor okay so i guess then in your practice or in your overall perspective you are definitely looking at childhood nutrition like the omega-3s and the sugar but you're also looking at what mom and dad have to eat even before they conceive and then obviously during conception and onwards anything else to say about that before we move to children no, I think we, I think find we that covered that. that. About the breast milk. Okay, so then in your Montessori work, you worked with children. I think you wrote this book called The Free Brainy Breakfasts. It was conceived during that time because you yes. were so focused on needing to, wanting kids to eat well. And did you want to say more about your book or about ideas in that book about good diet for children, besides obviously not eating sugar? Of course. The Sugar-Free Brainy Breakfast for Kids booklet. That's exactly what it was. I just, because I was writing down and taking those copious notes when I was observing the children as a teacher, I was writing down what the kids that were doing so well with what they were eating between that and my research. And my diet was changing. My diet was always changing. So that booklet, I wrote that booklet years ago, and then I have edited it, updated it. So that was really important. So I gave it, you know, I just gave it to all of the parents, you know, just freely, because, you know, I wanted to see the children succeed. And I knew just the nutritional 
I knew we were doing what we were doing in the classroom, but what the, the parents were doing at home was just as important and, and how important breakfast was to start their day. Tell us about some takeaways in that book besides watch out for the milk, cut out the sugar. Were they open to the whole idea of sugar addiction at that time or are they now? Now my families are. I think, first of all, and this is an important point, the focus when I was working with the kids, even when I was making food at school and then observing the children, and this is also the focus of the Sugar-Free Brainy Breakfast for Kids booklet, and my work with children now is really the same, is that the brain essentials, I start out focusing on the brain essentials, the complex carbohydrates, the fat, and the complete proteins, because many of these children are not getting enough. You know, they're very active, you know, the brain uses up 300 calories a day without thinking of it. And some of these kids are like, whoa, they're so, so smart and bright. And I think their brains are even using up more. Mm-hmm. So that's a meal and they're just not getting enough food. So th- the focus is on the macronutrients. And somehow, Vera, at that age, the cravings, well, even adults too, the cravings for sugar just seem to lessen once they're eating enough of the slower burning foods. Right, because they're really just trying to get the energy that they're not getting in their insufficient protein, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. They're eating too many simple carbohydrates, just like, you know, a lot of adults, teens, too many simple carbohydrates, and they're getting too much norepinephrine. So you have the anxiety, you have the inability to focus, it affects sleep, it affects your mood, the moodiness. Oh, one second he was this way, then another second, you know, he was, I don't know what happened. But if you look at their diet, you know, they got a quick drop in brain glucose and there's no fuel. Right. So with the focus on the macronutrients in the food plans, with my work with children, with adults, you know, we focus on, first of all, the protein, the complex carbohydrates, and of course, the fats that regulate them. So moving to the complex carbohydrates, especially with children, is important because they're so active and they need the slower burning complex carbohydrates like beans, you know, Ezekiel bread, whole grains, steel cut oats, you know, things like that, sprouted grain breads, because it stays in the system because there are nutrients on board. The body manufactures the food and breaks it down to uptake the nutrients. And vegetables too, of course. Yeah, and then the protein helps. Yeah, that those are definitely, the micronutrients definitely, and the vegetables are the complex carbohydrates as well. Carrots are wonderful. Broccoli keeps you full, keeps you slow burning. Of course, that's part of the complex carbohydrates. And then the protein, you know, it takes a while to break the protein down into amino acids. And that's where you get the precursors. Instead of getting that hit of dopamine and serotonin from the quick hit of a simple carb, you get the precursors when you're eating the complex carbs and the protein throughout the day, the precursors to dopamine and serotonin, you know, the tryptophan. So you're getting the precursors. So you're making the, like the feel good chemicals throughout the day rather than, you know, just going at the hit after the hit and not getting the nutrition. And so that's why, you know, a lot of children are having problems in school. They're behind. If it should be that you have a child and their parents are able to correct the food, they're eating more complex carbs and they're now eating proteins, so they don't need the sugar as much. Do you see that it's possible that children could eat sugar moderately, like before they become addicted? Is it okay if they have a cake on their birthday or, you know, on Halloween or something? What would you say? Yeah, so that's, yeah, I would say, you know, it's a tricky thing. The American Heart Association suggests, you know, 25 grams of sugar or less for children. No added sugar. This is added sugar. No added sugar for children under the age of two. So what I basically do, these kids are entrenched in sugar. It's in the house. It's in their diets. So we wean them off, you know, so it's not like sugar-free right away the wean them off of the sugar. So in in smaller amounts. So instead of having that 25 grams at one time, we think of it in terms of like seven grams here, you spread it out throughout the day. And that's a help because then they have to start eating other things and they're just going to feel better. They're going to be full and they're not going to be reaching out as much for the sugar and they're reaching out Hunger is a huge motivator for them grabbing for the snack foods and sugar. Yeah, they get an instant, you know, hit a burst of energy 
but no staying power. So they want more and more. So it's just kind of a. So can you see if they reverted back to a better diet, being able to eat sugar in moderation? Well, if the children, yeah, with little ones, it's very difficult because the parents are eating the sugar. They're not sugar free. So it's going to be in the house. It's part of their lifestyle. But a lot of times the parents start eating better when they start working on helping their children. Yeah. So to answer your question, for children to go to a birthday party, and there's little tricks to the trade if they go, I mean, there's a portion size. You know, we talk about portion sizes and chewing. I even work with older children with chewing just to get in the habit of, you know, eating slowly. So, you know, whatever you're eating, you could practice it when you go to a birthday party and just get a small portion, that kind of thing. But I just think that I've even had families tell me that their children's, this one autistic boy, that his taste buds changed because we were so used now to eating salads and he was feeling better. So he was just kind of withdrawing from eating, you know, too much of, of the sugar. Do you believe that some kids can actually be addicted to sugar? I mean, I think I read somewhere that you had said that some of your young clients are addicted to sugar. And I would imagine then you would not recommend moderation in sugar. Well, you know, they all are, like I said, 99%, they all are. And the 800 pound gorilla in the waiting room or in the classroom many times is sugar addiction masquerading as picky eating, you know? So they're not eating the foods, the healthy foods, because, you know, they want the simple carb, they want the sugar. So once we can pan for the gold, and once they can eat, you know, more of the macro micronutrients, the foods, you know, you know, all of the macronutrients and the vegetables and fruit, et cetera, whether it be in a smoothie, we just pull way back. They just have wean away, wean down on the sugar, basically, you know, thinking of it even in five to seven grams, maybe had they have a half of a protein bar, but it's always an, as an accessory, always a priority is the healthy food first. But the That's idea is to wean, the wean, to wean to get off for the sugar addicts. Right, right, yeah. right. The wean as much as possible. But, you know, the parents are usually That's have it in just the house. And they're, sure, they're the sugar addicts. Yeah, I was just going to say, what do you do with the parents when you recommend so, what must be a dramatic change in the household? They show up for the appointments, Vera. They slowly, you know, the cereal, they stop serving the cereal in the morning. They do the bacon and eggs and the uh, half a cup of oatmeal or whatever. And the parents, maybe through osmosis, they they start doing better. I don't know if they're ever completely sugar-free. You know, I always talk about sugar addiction and I call it what it is. Uh And I recommend Dr. Gorin's book. And I just see them, you know, I just see that it's life-changing, even cutting back for the children because they just start doing better. They sleep better. They're focused. You know, they're happier. They're not as nervous. You know, their anxiety lessens. They're calmer. They're happier. What do you do with a family member who says, well, my kid is a picky eater. Like like you said, that's the elephant in the room. And they will have a temper tantrum. They just won't change. What do you do with that situation? Well, we have to pan for the gold and what they are eating. Their preferred foods. So a lot of times it's mac and cheese. Yeah. So we take the processed foods and we add fresh food to it. That's helpful in baby steps because that really helps them. We got to get these nutrients into them somehow and adding the grass fed cheese or the hundred percent grass fed butter, you know, they're going to get secondhand salad from the cow. (laughs) So, you know, this way just slowly, but surely, and you just have to, you know, figure out a way. Every child likes pizza. Okay. So you have a jar of tomato sauce. <laughs> I call it the high octane tomato sauce. And when you're making a uh, ground beef or a ground turkey or whatever, or even if you're vegetarian and it's tofu, you add it to the tomato sauce and you have that in your refrigerator you, and you blend it and then you add it to this sauce. I mean, you do whatever you need to do. We got to get these nutrients in this child because it's not only that they're addicted to sugar, they're miserable. You know, they're like, they're just falling apart with the tantrums and they're so, so unhappy. So that would be, you know, an example, the uh, chickpea pasta for the mac and cheese. So that has iron and protein and that's more of a complex carbohydrate and getting the slower burning nutrients and foods into their system. So they're not you know, hungry, they just feel better. Plus they're getting, you know, more protein in their, you know, their brains are happier. 
So it's following that same principle that once the kid gets the nutrients into them, they'll be able to let go of the sugar more. Exactly. Yeah. Now, what about adolescents? What about teenagers? Any difference there? Concerns? I guess nutritional differences? Well, uh, there's a lot of concerns. You know, it's a tough time with all the hormones and coming of age and the brain is still developing. The prefrontal cortex and executive functioning is, you know, it's just developing. And we see so much in society today, the depression, anxiety in the teenage years. And, you know, they're really vulnerable. They're in a lot of pain and, you know, with social media and all of that. And it's heartbreaking and no one ever mentions their diet, you know, what they're eating and what they should be eating, you know, and how that's impacting how they feel. Because, I mean, we're all going to have times in our lives when things are hard, times are hard. But at least at the cellular level, when we're eating right, you know, we have that buffer there. Do you have yeah. a, a recommendation for a diet for an adolescent that might be different than the child's, like more of something or less of something? It would be individualized, the same thing. And a lot of times they're eating a Vera the same way or they're not eating breakfast, right? And there's no protein left. I mean, fat and carbohydrates are stored. The amino acids and protein deteriorate. So they've been sleeping and they wake up in the morning and they don't eat breakfast. So they have, you know, no protein in their system or their brain. So they can't focus, you know, then they eat not eating lunch and not eating, you know, just eating junk food and things like that. So it's the same thing. Uh, okay. what focusing about, uh, on the macro and micronutrients. Okay. And what about the kid who says, I think I want to become a, because often this happens in adolescence. They want to become a vegan or a vegetarian for sort of uh, spiritual, religious, political reasons. What do you say to that? I mean, yes, yeah, absolutely fine. Just as long as your daily nutritional recommendations and intake is sufficient you know, for your physical and mental health. So it doesn't matter what plan that you follow, you know, as long as you have options for the B12, you're getting enough iron, you know, you're getting enough, you know, if you're taking an omega-3, if you're not eating fish, you're taking algal oil, which is from the algae, which is what the fish eats for their omega-3 DHA. So any food plan will really fit if you're mindful and making sure you're getting all the nutrients that you need on a daily basis. So I would suggest, you know, working with a nutritionist. So I think everybody should work with a nutritionist and get an individualized food plan. Okay. And I, I take it that that's something that you do in your private practice. Right. Exactly. Do you want to elaborate a little bit about that? Sure. I work with individuals. We do a nutritional intake, health history, all of that. And they fill out a food frequency form and we can see, see what they're eating and where this, where we need to bump it up. Like if they're not eating enough vegetables or green or folate, or if they're not eating enough protein or fat, a lot of us are not eating enough fat. Like olive oil is so important because it partners with omega-3s to enter into the cell membrane. So the two are the dynamic duo. So I look at the fats, make sure those are balanced, that they're eating enough protein, look at their energy levels, you know, what is their metabolic needs? Are they really active individuals and they would need to eat more? Do they need to eat more frequently? And how we know, we put a template in place and it's just, you know, then we have to take it for a test drive to see how they feel. And that's where the meal mapping forms come in. And that's really the nuts and bolts of my work with clients. What what is a meal map? It's a meal mapping form, breakfast, the time, And, you know, if they had something in between, a mini meal or whatever, and then lunch. I I don't even call them snacks. I call them mini meals. That is a a substantial, even if it's small, meal. And then observations and then lunch observations. And the more detail we can see, you know, were they hungry? Were they anxious? Were they feeling calmer? Was sleep better? Was digestion better? It's almost like a dose by dose. Yeah. Yeah. A dose yeah. by dose effect of mood and some of these conditions like ADHD or whatever, if there's been any change. Right. I had a meeting with the teacher and Johnny was really, really focusing, you know, a whole lot better. And we can see that the mornings are better. And then we can see what the child was eating and we just tweak it. You know, maybe they need more, but we always got to get the vegetables in there yeah. because the vegetables and fruit are, you know, fruit or, you know, I know they, that can be triggering for a lot of people that are, you know, in our community. 
but it's a way for kids to eat more vegetables with the smoothie yeah. because they need that. They definitely need that folate. So it's just a balancing act, Vera, just to okay. make sure. But through observation is really how we can tell how it's working, you know, yeah. and with adults too, you can see if there was more cravings for food. Well, what was it a legitimate craving because you didn't eat enough for breakfast? Right. Yes, you know, I see you asking that a lot in the Facebook page when somebody says, I'm still craving, you're always asking, well, are you eating enough? And I'm going to assume that you don't think cereal is the answer for breakfast. No, no, it's dessert. It's nothing. And there are some healthier ones. I guess Ezekiel makes one, you know, but children would never eat it. Uh -huh. I don't think it has any sugar in it. But no, but sometimes you have to keep it in there, you know, with really picky eaters, it's like compromise. All right, if I can still have like a half a cup of honey bunches of oat, I'll eat my bacon and eggs. I say, it's a deal. Okay, all right. Can you tell us about your book, Hannah Was Eating Junk? It's going to come out? Yes, and you know, Vera, it's taking forever, but it's going to be worth the wait. I just had an hour and a half meeting with my illustrator, and the food characters are, we're working on a scene right now with the food character beans is fighting with the ice cream <laughs> in the freezer and the beans is saying to ice cream ice cream you're crass i'm going to pass gas right into your door so you'll melt to the floor oh good and you can see like the, there's a lot of graphic children's humor in the book i can't wait for it to come out i know it's taking a long time but, i'm gonna uh, be the first to push it because kids need to have something like that that's fun and instructive. Yeah. 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 We have a lot of fun in our appointments too, in our telemed sessions, because I'm just a big, silly kid. I would have a, a whoopee cushion, but I don't think the director of my medical practice would be too happy with that. <laughs> but anyway, the kids love it. So, yeah. So, the book, we're working on it. I was just going to say for oh, yes, anybody okay. that's interested in the progress, you can go to my website. Okay. I'll ask you about sure. that in a second. Just as I sort of in closing, I have a few questions. What would you say is the most important thing that we in the field of food addiction and outside for our young in terms of either individual or policy or professional? What would you like to see happen? I would just say early intervention and increased nutritional education in medical school. I think that's so important. They should devote like a whole year to that, I think. You know, just really, there's a disconnect and there shouldn't be. Okay. You know, yeah, so focus on early intervention, like at that preconception level, basically. And yes. not, not only, also like the breast milk. I didn't know that about breast milk. So like at that early level too. And, you know, I know there are some that are trying to get processed foods healthier and that kind of thing. But if only manufacturers on boxes could just say, you know, this is processed, but eat some real food with it, you know, like on a cereal box. If you're going to have this, have a, just your portion, a half a cup, but eat bacon and eggs with it or rice and beans or, you know, whatever, just eat some real food with this. Okay. Well, so then what's next for you? I guess Tana is one thing that's next for you. Anything yeah, else my, coming up? My kid's book is very important to me. And then doing more podcasts. I'd like to do more just really, you know, the kid's book. And then after that, maybe there'll be another one. Okay. So then tell us if we do want to follow your progress, tell us how we can get a hold of you. Sure. My website is nutritionforlearning.com. And that would be a good way for you to see the progress of my book because I have some scenes from the book. And also you could receive my Glad I Ate a Superstar stickers. It's a handout. And then if you subscribe, I will also notify you. You'll get the stickers. Glad I ate a superstar. All of my kids that I see get it. It's a round little cute little sticker. You'll get that. And you'll also be notified when my book is available. And I'm also active at a sugar-free for life support group site. Yes. I really enjoy chiming in there. And it's a great community. And if they join your website, then I think you said that you give copies of your Brainy book? I give away like my ebook, Hannah Was Eating Junk. This is the second edition. I'm redoing all the illustrations. So I give that to all of my patients at no charge. But the Brainy Breakfast for Kids, I'm not giving that away on my website. But I give it to my patients and I would contribute it to our community there at uh, Sugar Free for Life. 
community. I'd be happy to. Okay, well, thank you. Contribute. So the final question that we always ask is uh, that our signature question of if you could tell a younger version of yourself something about sugar addiction or maybe nutritional information, what would you tell yourself? What would you say? Yeah, I've been thinking about this one. Well, I would say to my younger self, looking at my mind's eye, that sugar is a tough, <laughs> was a tough sparring partner. And I'm glad you got out of the ring. And I'm just really proud of you because you showed up when it was hard. And just you were always in line for your purpose, even though you might not have been aware of it. And you were blessed with many angels disguised as humans along the way. And, you know, hopefully this information in my kids' book, which is really important to me to for the early intervention, a really a priority. And I want to get that out there. Yeah, to help with not only with their mental and cognitive wellness in their childhood, but as they enter adulthood and, you know, other, of course, diabetes, heart disease, you know, all, all kinds of problems. So early intervention is key. All right. Well, thank you so much, Jan, for spending the hour to speak with us about your thoughts about early childhood nutrition and preconception nutrition and also the work that you do. And we're very much looking forward to that book, Hannah. Anyway, thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you, Vera. Thanks for joining us this week on Food Junkies, Recovery from Food Addiction. Make sure to join our Facebook group, Sugar Free for Life Support Group, I'm Sweet Enough. You can subscribe to our show in iTunes or Stitchers. That way you'll never miss an episode. While you're at it, if you found value in this show, we'd appreciate a rating on iTunes. Or if you'd simply tell a friend about the show, that would help us out too. Don't forget to pick up your copy of Dr. Tarman's book, Food Junkies, which is available on Amazon. If you have any additional questions, both Molly and Clarissa are food addiction professionals and work one-on-one -on -one with clients. You can find their websites and email addresses in the show notes. Be sure to tune in every Friday when our new episodes drop. As Vera loves to say, the power is ours. <laughs>